All right, Peter, it's all yours. All right. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, uh, A&V, for inviting me here. Uh, I think uh, history is always one of those subjects that people are always interested in, especially if you're part of a community. Uh, and uh, I've been living in Arlington now at least uh, 44 years, came down to go to school at American University. Um, and uh, I'm never, never ceases to amaze me the little tidbits of historical information you can glean from what's going on here in Arlington. Uh, so <laughs> before I even begin, I encourage everyone to get on your phone, go to the App Store, and download the... Um, uh, 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 the app, the Arlington Historical app. It's what I've been working on for the last six months. Uh, Arlington County last year did a historical preservation grant and I, I was one of the awardees. And my project that they accepted was, uh, you know, this uh, website and app. So before I go into the lengthy presentation, I thought we'd have a little fun and do a little quick quiz on Arlington. I mean, for those of you that have been living here for years, some of these questions might surprise you, but I'm just gonna go through a couple of questions. You don't have to answer them, but write down your answers and then I'll, you'll see if you get them correct or not. Okay, question number one, uh, Roosevelt Island uh, had two other names. One was Mason Island. Do you know what the third original name was? Okay, uh, next question. In what year did Captain Smith, and I put in quotations, discover Arlington? Obviously, for the Native Americans living there, they didn't need to be discovered. They knew where they were. But um, uh, so Captain Smith and Pocahontas, and it's an interesting part of our history. Uh, this next one is really surprising. Uh, what important technology is claimed to have been invented in Arlington? OK. Uh, next one, a little, uh, little uh, more recent history. Where did Deep Throat meet Washington Post reporter Bob Woodward during Watergate? Okay. Um, and uh, I'll give you an uh, advance warning. I am a Civil War, you know, uh, historian buff, and uh, I could have probably just done the whole Arlington historical about the Civil War. So I had to throw in something about the Civil War. What lyrics did uh, uh, abolitionist poet Julia Ward Howe write in 1861 after riding through Union camps on Upton's Hill? Okay. And finally, this one always kind of interests me, and that is what famous World War II vehicle did the Army test at Fort Myer? Okay. Uh, so again, I'll, I'll let you take the, a, a gander at those questions one more time. Um, before I reveal the answers, Gary, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you, do you know the answer to the first one? Uh, is it Anna Lawson Island? Yes. Okay. Let's applaud for Gary. We can put the little clapping hands. Thank you, Gary. Okay. Um, uh, Peter, before you go, um, somebody has suggested that you switch to full screen on your, uh, presentation. Because we can see it on the edges, you know, the rest of your desktop and stuff. Okay, that's full screen on my browser. Well, or... I'm... Just... I'm not hearing. I'm not hearing you, Gary. It just says the comment is if you would switch to full screen, so the the presentation that you're showing is there a a full I'm... screen. I... I'm going through a browser, so um, he can't hear you. Oh no, no that's never. the wrong one. Okay. Gary, yeah. What? I, if you tell me what you want me to do, I'll do it. But I'm not it, clear. It's the it's one of the other buttons up there on the the left left there. One of them makes it full screen on the left on the that red. browser on the top of the window on the top bar of the browser there. The yeah, all the way over now. No, nope, don't don't, don't drag it over. No, nope, don't drag it. <laughs> You're saying on the left or the right? Pat? The left, the left top left. There's a there's three little buttons there. One of them makes it go away. One of them closes it. One of them I think makes it bigger. No, you're talking. No. You're talking this. He doesn't see that. It's a, the red. You have to by color. You're talking here. It's, no, no. On the top, on the top line of that browser, there's three buttons. One, one's re yellow, red, and. Oh green. yes. Okay. There, there we go. go. Okay. 
Thank you. Yes. Okay. All right. So we're ready to go through the answers here. Uh, okay. Um, here's the answers. In what year did Captain Smith discover Arlington? 1608. It just kind of goes to show you the recorded history for Arlington really does go back a significant number of centuries. Did anyone know the answer to this next question? Yes, it was a DARPA project, right? My God, you guys are brilliant. Well, okay, good. Okay, so the younger people I probably would baffle with, but okay. Did you all know, do you all know where the parking garage is in Roslyn? Yes, you know that? Yep. I actually went to visit that. I was surprised it was still there. Supposedly it was supposed to have been torn down a couple of years ago. All right. Uh, you all know the story of Julia Ward Howe, and she wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic. I recently uh, read that she actually knew John Brown. She was, uh, he was someone that was a contemporary. She, her husband was a well-known abolitionist, but if you studied her life story, he wasn't really a nice guy and he didn't treat her very well. And he certainly was a, wasn't a supportive uh, husband. So the fact that she actually uh, became very famous because of writing this, the, this poem, but she hated this, the original song was John Brown's Body. A lot of people think that John Brown's body came after the Battle Hymn of the Republic, but it originally was the original lyrics to that tune. And she just really thought it was horrendous. And she was coming back from the uh, Bailey's Crossroad Review, the Grand Review that McClellan had and Lincoln came out in November of 1861. And at that time, people were coming uh, in order to travel, there were probably two main roads. One was Wilson Boulevard, which back then was the Georgetown Road or the Aqueduct Bridge Road. And people would come up that road to get to Leesburg Pike. And finally, did anyone know the answer? The Jeep? The Jeep actually was tested. The main facility for testing was outside of Baltimore. But the uh, uh, believe it or not, uh, long before they added more graves prior to World War II, there was plenty open area in Fort Myer and the Jeep was tested rigor rigorously there, so, among other vehicles. So, uh, okay, so obviously keep testing yourself on history and I hope you guys are downloading the Arlington Historical app. Uh, you can um, find some interesting stories there. Okay, why am I here? Well, um, you know, for those that uh, get their history by uh, reading books and stuff like that, and over the course of the last 30 years, there's been a big shift in humanities and they're leveraging digital technology. So um, I actually went back to school. I retired from the federal government. I'll talk a little bit more about my background, but uh, uh, this whole shift in using digital technologies and social media and uh, public history has really kind of changed the facing of history. The, the uh, project that I'm working on right now, Arlington Historical, it reflects the fact that, um, no joke, I think finding history about Arlington is very, very difficult. And I'm actually on the board for the Arlington Historical Society. So it's very, very frustrating in trying to get people to become more aware of their own histories. And part of the problem also is, is that if you go back to the 1950s when the Arlington Historical Society was started. History and being able to publish history was not easy for everyone. So uh, it's um, definitely uh, uh, an opportunity for people to be able to tell their stories with these new technologies. And we could talk a little bit about that. I started talking earlier about how I got involved with history. And that was because I was very interested in the Civil War. And when I moved into Arlington 40 years ago, I asked, and I'm from New York State, so coming down to Virginia, I was like really excited about the Civil War because Arlington was right in the middle of it. And I'm asking people lots of questions about Arlington's role in the Civil War. And a lot of people said, oh, nothing ever happened. We had forts and camps, but nothing. And then I came across a New York Times article that basically said the first skirmish that took place in the American Civil War was here in Arlington. So um, I was part of a group that uh, actually gathered information and we actually put a Civil War trail sign at uh, Arlington Mills off of Columbia Pike. And this is a video I did for that project, so.
In the spring of 1861, Northern Virginia found itself in the midst of a civil war. The attack on Fort Sumter in South Carolina on April 12th and Virginia's vote to ratify the Ordinance of Secession on May 23rd ensured that the peaceful countryside of Arlington was about to change. Across the Potomac River, the federal city of Washington had become an armed camp. Tens of thousands of Union volunteers and regular soldiers rushed to the capital to protect it from a feared invasion from the South. On May 24, 1861, President Abraham Lincoln ordered federal troops to secure the Arlington Heights and the city of Alexandria. The rolling hills that extended from Rosalind to Four Mile Run were called the Arlington Line, a strategic position to defend in case of a rebel attack. Thousands of inexperienced Union troops marched across the Long Bridge and down the Columbia Turnpike into Arlington. Among these soldiers were members of the 1st Michigan and the 11th New York, or better known as the 1st New York Fire Zouaves. The Fire Zouaves were well known. Their leader, Colonel Elmer Ellsworth, had recently been killed in Alexandria and was considered the war's first hero. He died trying to remove a rebel flag from the roof of the Marshall Inn. Companies from both the Michigan and New York regiments were ordered to protect the intersection of Columbia Turnpike and the Alexandria Loudoun and Hampshire Railroad near Arlington Mill. Columbia Pike was a major road linking Washington with Fairfax Courthouse. The railroad, started in the mid-1850s, had only recently been extended to Leesburg. Arlington Mill was a well-known landmark. It was built in 1836 by George Washington Park Custis, the adopted son of George Washington and the father-in-law of Confederate Army General Robert E. Lee. Union troops camped near the mill and spent many hours a day drilling and learning how to soldier. The Virginia militia was still close by and monitored the northern soldiers. Both sides set up outposts and pickets along the newly formed front lines. On the night of June 1, 1861, Company E of the 1st Michigan was on picket duty at Arlington Mill. Members of Company G of the 1st New York Fire Zouaves rested in a nearby house. At about 11 p.m., nine Virginia militiamen fired a volley on the Union sentries. One Zouave soldier was killed and one wounded. A member of the militia was wounded as well. The Virginians were driven off after a brief exchange of musket fire. The Arlington Mill skirmish was reported in the New York Times. It was considered an important military engagement at the time. The first battle of Bull Run was yet to come, and the true horrors of the war were still unknown. But the skirmish did reveal that the city of Washington was vulnerable to attack. During the next several years, the Union Army constructed dozens of earthen forts that dotted the landscape. Remnants of some of these defenses still remain a reminder of the hidden history that still can be found in Arlington County, and a time when soldiers of the North and South prepared for a war that would change the United States forever. Okay, I could spend this whole class just talking about that video and all the imagery in it. Uh, anyone live near Arlington Mill? Anyone? Uh, I, yeah, I did. I grew up in Claremont and we used to ride our bikes down to the ice house, which is the old mill. Yeah, interesting enough, when you saw that photograph, which I got from uh, University of Maryland, that's not being constructed. All those planks that were being taken off were being used by the Civil War soldiers to um, uh, for campfires. And the mill was considered one of the largest on the East Coast. The, the wheel, the mill wheel was like 30 feet diameter. So it was considered one of the larger ones. Um, Again, this is kind of what got me started in 2016. I was still working, but I, uh, you know, a group of us, you know, got the Civil War trail sign put there. And that's what got me started thinking about when I retire, what do I want to, you know, do when I grow up? And uh, so just to give you a little background about who I am, uh, over 40 something years ago, I started my career. I was a photojournalist working for the United States Information Agency. That happens to be a photograph I took of Ronald and Reagan and Nancy at the White House with uh, the Israeli leader, Menachem Begin. Um, and that's uh, me to the right. I now do living history and I 
portray Matthew Brady. And that's me working in the center lower. Uh, that's me at the White House working for CNN. I shifted from photojournalism to broadcast journalism. And when CNN started in the early 80s, um, it was very hard to get a job as a still photographer. And um, I ended up uh, working for CNN for several years and then uh, going back to the United States Information Agency. I ended my career about four years ago. Uh, you probably know Voice of America, but the oversight agency for Voice of America is called the uh, uh, United, States United States Agency for Global Media. And I ended up my career as a deputy chief information officer, CIO. And basically my whole career was watching the introduction of digital technology and its impact on media. So, you know, back in the 80s, everything was linear. When you did video editing, it was linear and then started the introduction of nonlinear editing. Um, and uh, I, I always kind of find it very interesting that you hold in your hand a mobile phone that empowers you to do what I was doing 40 years ago with CNN when we had those microwave and satellite trucks and we were able to produce videos and send them around the world, the, in essence, you're able to do that with your mobile phone. And I don't think people realize the power that they have, the communication power that they have in that $500 device, where that was a half a million dollars 40 years ago. Um, I said, I went back, I got a master's in digital humanities and uh, uh, I also graduated from, uh, I went back during the government, sent me back to school, to get a master's in information technology. And prior to that, I met my wife at American University, where I was getting a degree in international communications. And just to kind of round it up, I'm currently on a board member with the Historical Society, and uh, I'm slated to be vice president. So if you've got any issues with the Historical Society, feel free to, to come see me. I don't know if you're aware, but we're trying to renovate the Hume School. It's one of the oldest surviving you know, schools in Arlington. And we do have a museum there. And plus we manage the ball cellars. Okay, so that's kind of what uh, got me going. And then one of the other things, when I, went, um, uh, when I went back to school, my graduate project was coming up with this website uh, called Mapping the Civil War in Arlington. Uh, if you're really interested into Civil War history, I uh, encourage you uh, to take a look at that. It's the initials mapping the civil war in Arlington. And um, what I learned in doing this graduate project was using a curation software that allows you to put collections online. So all, you know, if you really want to know some of the unique stories about the civil war in Arlington, it's a good place to start. It's not finished, but like, here's the difference between writing a book and doing a digital project. Digital projects just live on forever, but most people like me stop at some point and go on to the next thing. So this, this is the, the big difference. When people write a book, they finish the book, they publish it. But these digital projects, they just, they don't have a, um, an ending. And uh, I mean, I just didn't have the resources to finish out a mapping the Civil War. There's probably hundreds of additional things that I could put up and, and put there. So, um, so that being said, uh, Wanted to give you a little background about digital history. Uh, the term is rooted in the late 1990s. Virginia just happens to be kind of a, the University of Virginia, Virginia Tech happened to be leaders in digital history and the digital humanities. Um, and just the term itself, digital history. Most people interchange the term digital humanities, digital history, public history. And, and again, the key in all this is really the fact that now anyone, all of you that are watching this presentation, you all could post a blog, a social media, you could do a historical reference, you could do a family history. You, you're, you're empowered with these technologies, and we'll talk a little bit more about the, the back-end technologies. But the key is, is that what used to be a very privileged role of being a historian is now open to a wider group of people. And I think it's reflecting in the type of history that you're now seeing. It's more, and, and again, this is the term, I'm not trying to get political here, but it's called the democratization of history. It means that the masses can come and, and participate and share histories. It, it's, not a, it's not a very cha a narrow channel. And um, 
Why is that important? I'm showing you a graph that I got for another project, and I don't know if you can see it clearly, but um, this was a report published about a month ago, two months ago, and uh, believe it or not, there's over 8 billion people in the world today, all right? And that's what you know the statistics say. Of the 8 billion people, over 5 billion now have access to the internet, all right? And um, that's an amazing figure. And when you think about the, the power of a single individual to post something on the internet and reach an audience of 5, million, 5 billion people, that's, that's pretty fascinating. And I think it really, it really puts in perspective that, I mean, you know, uh, if you publish a historical you know, uh, biography or something like that, what the potential audience can you reach in a published book? versus what, what you could possibly reach with social media, whatever. But I get it. We can talk about this later, but there's a balance between people who are writing books are really taking their time to get it right versus someone who just go ahead and posts on social media. And we know darn well the, the, the accuracy of a lot of the material that's being published on social media. All right, so digital storytelling. It's another concept. I'm actually teaching a class for Encore as we speak right now on digital storytelling. And it's a little bit different than digital history. Digital history really is the, the big Venn diagram and digital storytelling is a subcomponent, which is the ability you know, to take and put your own storytelling, whether it's for history, your family legacy or whatever. And I think a lot of families, they start out with, you know, oh my God, I got 20,000 photographs you know, stored on my iPhone. What am I gonna do with all this? You know. And again, if you've ever had to do one of those slideshows and put to video, you're doing digital storytelling, right? You're taking the imagery and you're putting it to music or a narration. And it's kind of what I did for that, you know, story for Arlington Mill. And then, and then finally, I think it's important to note that these technologies are changing the way historians argue history. Now, if you've never taken a humanities class, critical theory and all that stuff, when you study history, they're always asking you, what's your argument? What are you, what are you, the case that you're making? It's not enough just to say this happened, this happened, and this happened. You have to say, why is that significant? And when I started getting involved with um, doing a lot of stuff on Civil War, I started to realize that Arlington, while it wasn't Gettysburg, you know, in three days, Gettysburg is this horrific battle that people you know, a lot of lives were lost and it was a turning point in the Civil War. But I also make the case that it might not have been three days, but for three years, Arlington was right at the cutting edge of the Confederates and the, and the Union forces. There were tens of thousands of soldiers here. A lot of the, the Civil War leaders that you read the biographies about, they all got their start in Arlington. Uh, if you're familiar with George McClellan and the Army of the Potomac and all that, Matthew Brady, photojournalism, all of that stuff is rooted uh, in the Civil War. And Gary, what was the one Civil War antidote that you mentioned earlier? Oh, I, I mentioned the, the uh, first anti-aircraft artillery fire. Right. So if you don't know the history, Thaddeus uh, Lowe, he got permission by Lincoln to create the uh, Balloon Corps. And he would come out to Arlington and launch these aerial balloons that were tethered. And uh, when the Confederates saw that, they would fire, you know, at the balloon. And uh, uh, so they experimented with a lot of technologies. People don't realize that tel the telegraphy was still relatively new. And hundreds of miles of telegraph wire were strewn all over the place here in Arlington. And they experimented with rubberized cable in order to just lay the cable on the ground instead of putting it on the trees or, or um, uh, in uh, telegraph posts. So Arlington, uh, and there were over 22 forts in Arlington uh, out of a total 68 that are all around Washington. So just to kind of um, get back to the, the humanities part, you know, uh, digital history is using this confluence of new technologies. We've got computing technology. We have, you know, the, the ability to capture digitally audio, video, You've got the ability to store it offline or in the cloud. And then you have the ability through online to, you know, publish 
online digitally your content and you're looking my website is a is a you know blog whatever that you're able to um you know visit and uh, uh i can reach people that way so the the bottom line this is really just changing the way uh things are are advancing so let's why am i here why was i invited here well um last year arlington county um decided that they uh, wanted to promote historic preservation. They wanted uh, people to present their ideas of, of projects. And I presented um, uh, this uh, project based on what I knew other cities were doing. So uh, the technology that I invested in, it wasn't that I invented this technology. I basically got the funds from Arlington County to create using technology that I learned about at George Mason University. And uh, there's about 60 uh, cities across the United States that are doing what I'm doing. A lot of them, uh, so by the way, I got a lot of teasing from the historical society saying, why did you call it Arlington Historical? And I said, well, at the time I wasn't a member of the historical society. And I didn't even know that Arlington County was going to um, allow me to get the grant. So a lot of the other cities uh, use the term historical. So like Cleveland historical and other cities, they use that term. So um, that's why when I submitted the proposal, that was the name that I submitted, Arlington Historical. And then after I submitted the proposal, they asked me to be on the board. And then I said, uh oh, what's gonna happen if I get the grant? And I got the grant. So um, I suspect someday that uh, this historical society is going to take this over. It makes sense, but uh, we'll we'll see how that goes. Again, I'm going to keep plugging. Go ahead and uh, download that app. It's a better experience from the website, but since I'm online right now, I'm going to go ahead. Uh, actually, Gary, I, I can pause and see if there's any questions right now that people want to ask. Okay, well, we've got a, a couple of, of comments. Um, one of them was the, the deep throat parking garage in uh, Roslyn. Um, they said they think the parking garage, the building next to it, which was a Safeway, has been replaced by a newer building. But yeah. The garage is still there. The garage is still there. I was there just months ago and took photographs, but they say it's going to be torn down. So, um, yeah, hey, yeah, go ahead. What were some of the other questions? Steve <laughs> said that... Uh, he and Craig Syfax created an 18 and a half minute video a number of years ago called Arlington Civil War. It was supposed to be the first in a series, but it didn't happen. And he's posted a link to YouTube for anybody that wants to go and watch that. Yeah. And I'm sorry, it was 18 minutes. That's 18 how long. And a half, which I'm sure was no coincidence. Uh, actually, yeah, I'd like to learn more about that. Um, and how long ago was that? Uh, Steve didn't say, he said a number of 11 years. years. Yeah, interesting. Um, one thing I, uh, well, I'll tell you what, I'll go ahead and uh, move forward and talk about the site. But um, I'll, I'll make one comment about Roslyn. I've been here 44 years. And, you know, I just remember getting out of Boston, seeing, you know, the putt-putt golf course and all that stuff, you know, the first time I came. I, and Rosalind, you know, the pawn shops and, you know, Rosalind wasn't what I would call the, the epitome of, of a, met, a metropolitan whatever. Um, but when I now go through Rosalind very rarely, I just can't get over the fact of the skyscrapers and the, the, the urbanization of Arlington and, um, uh, does does anyone know what Rosalind was famous for many, many years ago? Anyone? Um, uh, is anyone familiar with the the lawlessness that was Rosalind was well known for? The, yep. the brothels and uh, um, the crime and the betting and the gambling, the illegal drinking. And uh, in fact, it was so bad that there was on my website, I talk about it. There's a, a a route that farmers dreaded going through called Dead Man's Hollow. And uh, they would go to sell their crops in Georgetown, cross over the Aqueduct Bridge Road, the Aqueduct Bridge, and they would come back and they would get, you know, they'd have all their money and then people would come and mug them or kill them. And uh, it was a uh, notorious Dead Man's Hollow. 
So I, I, think, I think because of its proximity to Washington, people would go from Washington over the over the river to Roslyn to do whatever they wanted to do that was illegal. Um, yeah, it, it had a name. It was called the Monte Carlo of the East or whatever. They that the for the gambling and the prostitution and the drinking or whatever. So uh, I'm going to go ahead. Uh, I mean, I'm going to go ahead and plug my site because you're giving me the opportunity to do that. Before you did, do, we do yeah. have one additional observation. Uh, <clears throat> you know, you talked about getting a historical marker put up and. Uh, they said, you know, many of the, the older, the physical buildings, mills and things like that are gone. Right. So really hard to visualize what things were like. Um, but at least we do have the markers that kind of help guide you around and, and clue you in on what used to be on these different sites. Well, uh, you know, it's interesting. I mean, we could have a whole conversation about the process of getting access. What's really changed in the last 11 years since... Uh, Steve, you did probably his video project and I did mine, uh, uh, is the fact that you now have access online to search and retrieve digital information. I don't, I mean, you know, that photograph of the Arlington Mill. Uh, uh, and now what you're seeing is the prevalence of these uh, QR codes on on historic signage that allows people to um, uh be able to go to a website that's a companion to the digital signage. I'm actually working on a project right now with the Dominion Mills uh, Civic Association because I, I live there and we're doing three historic signs for the Fibri estate and we could talk about that. But uh, let me just kind of give you a rough uh, overview of, of Arlington Historical. Um, I, I think the best way to describe it, it's, it's an aggregation of history. It's not intended to be you know, a Stephen Ambrose or, you know, whatever uh, lengthy expose on historical stories. I, I kind of always chuckle with my colleagues at the Historical Society. We we produce an annual magazine and a lot of the articles that, that are published, you know, they're thousands of words. And if you go and, and, and play around with the stories of Arlington Historical, you know, we're talking about four to 600 words. And it really is, in my mind, kind of a a historical appetizer to get people interested in the history. And if done properly, it allows people to go further into doing more research. I think the um, the thing to note is, is that it's um, primarily based on a collection of stories. And uh, right now, um, as you can see, uh, since starting this in January and going public, we've, we've We've now published over 233 stories. And, uh, you know, recently, um, I don't know if you know the story about Miners Hill and, uh, you know, the War of 1812 and Dolly Madison trying to save the famous George Washington, you know, painting and all the other famous documents. Uh, it was a large uh, campsite, one of the higher points in Arlington. Uh, so again, it's a collection of stories. And when you, when you click on a story, like I did, here's one, uh, 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 here's an interesting story. On, well, they're all interesting, but this this woman was uh, one of the first sailors during the World War I, and they were called the Yeomanettes. I thought that was kind of interesting. You can almost have a rock group, or a singing group about it. And again, it's, it's part of this history of Arlington that allows uh, you to kind of dive in and, and pick apart uh, uh, things that, uh, you know, uh, basically um, you wouldn't have known. And uh, uh, it, part of part of uh, her story really is it's a fascinating how she ends up after the war, her and her husband, they bought the ball sellers house. So that's just that's just part of that's part of the story. So one of the, one of the things uh, uh, you can do is you can uh, visit the stories you can do uh, by map. You look at Arlington and see where you live in Arlington and and you're able to say, oh, what happened here? And then this is a story about a famous house, um, uh, different neighborhoods. Um, uh, I think, uh, let me see if I can find, um, uh, here's, this is a story I thought was kind of interesting. This is, uh, uh, actually, let me get to it. This is the duel. I think the, um, did you know that there was a famous duel in Arlington? You know, and this was these two uh, in 1826. 
these two guys got into an argument, John Randolph and Henry Clay. And, uh, you know, they decided to be gentlemen and shoot it out. And they all, they crossed, they crossed chain bridge and they came into what is now Arlington to have their fight. Neither one, neither one got killed, but it's still kind of interesting. There's a historic sign there, but the sign doesn't go into detail. So this is, you know, this, this story is represented, uh, you know, in, in terms of that. And then finally, the other thing that the, the site allows you to do is, you know, there's different tours. And so, you know, uh, I created one tour. So you think, you know, Arlington's history, and then I've assembled, you know, lots of stories about Arlington's history. Um, one of, one of the things, by the way, not having grown up in here, Arlington, for me, the whole 1950s and 1960s about, um, you know, um, desegregation and all that in the 50s and 60s. That's a pretty interesting history of Arlington. Arlington was on the cutting edge of that. Um, there was Deep Throat. Uh, for those of you that have never been to, um, uh, you know, uh, what's the, um, you know, Marcy Creek, uh, the thousands of years of uh, Native American archaeology and history, um, definitely interesting that you know long before captain you know john smith came the indians were here and they were making pottery and they were supposedly soapstone was in commodity in these quarries in arlington and they came there's the story about crandall mckay he was an uh, you know the attorney general and he he basically uh what was the movie about the mobsters that uh oh kevin kevin costner you know, in the Chicago and the gangsters. So Crandall McKay kind of played that role. He went, he went through and he basically shut down all the gambling halls and saloons of Roslyn or whatever. Probably didn't know this, but there were racetracks in Arlington. There was this one at the border of St. Asaph's uh, racetrack, right where they wanted to build the capital, the new capital center, right? That there was a there was a horse track place right there. This story is interesting, the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route. Did did anyone is anyone uh, aware of of the French's the French uh, military role in the Battle of Yorktown? I was I learned this just last year, and my wife is French, by the way. So this is a fascinating story that the French sent five thousand troops to Rhode Island. They landed at Rhode Island, and they marched from Rhode Island all the way down to Yorktown, and they came through Georgetown, crossed over. There was a ferry at the time, and they crossed over into Roslyn, down Ridge Road, uh, stopped at Mount Vernon. And that was the reason why the Americans were able to defeat the British at Yorktown. And the interesting side story is, is that they fooled the British in thinking that they were going to encircle New York. And the French army built these kind of uh, bakeries. So the, the, uh, the British kept smelling the French bread and thinking that the French were still there. So it's it's really kind of interesting. Um, for my colleague, Steve, hey, Steve, are you familiar with the Balls Crossroads skirmish? This is the one thing that I think I've introduced into the narrative of Arlington. The largest um, Civil War engagement to take place in Arlington was in August 27th, 1861. Don't know if you touched upon that 11 years ago, but when I was doing the research on this, it was pretty new intel, but Again, nothing's really new, as you know, in history. It just has to be rediscovered. And again, this history was there, just that a lot of people just felt that Arlington's Civil War history is overshadowed by Manassas and Antietam and Gettysburg. But if you're familiar with the Sunrise um, Retirement Home at Wilson Boulevard and Four Mile Run, uh, this skirmish took place and involved over 900 Confederate and Union troops. What people don't realize is that after the Battle of Bull Run, Manassas, the Confederates moved in and occupied Upton's Hill and Munson's Hill, right by the Sears. And they were there up until the end of September. And it was a, an annoyance to Abraham Lincoln and General McClellan, because from Munson's Hill, they flew a Confederate national flag, not the, not the battle flag. And people from Washington could see that flag flying from the capital city. And they kept on annoying the president and the journalists kept writing stories saying, hey, when, what are you gonna do about these Confederates 
because they, they could potentially invade Washington. So McClellan, who Lincoln said had the slows, uh, he, he basically waited until the Confederates finally moved before he finally in mass, you know, charged up those hills. And they, that's where they found the so-called Quaker guns, if you've ever uh, read about the Confederates putting these fake cannons. And years ago at Upton's Hill, the regional park, they had a uh, replica of a Quaker gun. But this uh, military engagement took place in Four Mile Run Valley, and it's right where the tennis courts are and uh, Bluemont Park. And that's pretty significant that this engagement took place on the 27th of August. And there was a union officer um, who wrote in his, bio in his own uh, autobiography about uh, Newton Colby was his name. And I found the book and he actually drew a map showing uh, the skirmish and showing uh, the Georgetown uh, Aqueduct Bridge Road. And you can see where Four Mile Run Cross and the railroad of the day, people don't know the history, but the original railroad was called the Alexandria Loudon Hampshire Railroad because it was designed to go from the city of Alexandria out to what's today Hampshire County in West Virginia. And the goal was to bring coal from West Virginia into Alexandria because Alexandria was a seaport and those ships used coal, the steamships. But I think, um, read the story on Ball's Crossroads Skirmish. It's kind of fascinating. The um, the idea that these forces kept on coming into Four Mile Run Valley and they were having skirmishes and firing at each other. And one of the interesting details of the skirmish is that several Confederates were wounded and killed and they brought their bodies back up to um, the Febri house uh, on Upton's Hill. And they used the house as a hospital, which it was used several times during the war. So, um, uh, so again, there's a difference in how you experience Arlington, histor Arlington Historical through the website and through the app. Any comments, anyone opening up the app and taking a look at it? Any questions about the experience with the app? The map is so much better with the app because it knows where you are and it's showing you stories close by to where you are with your phone. So Gary, any other questions? Uh, a few, yeah. Um, one is in general, what's the source of the information and the photos that you're digitizing and using? Are you borrowing from private collections or is it all public information? Most of the photographs, thank God, Library of Congress, it's um, um, uh, really fascinating. Um, uh, since I'm doing this for Arlington County, I get access to both the Historical Society and the Center for Local History. Um, I think the Center for Local History has done a great job, but uh, again, um, I think the problem with this is visibility. And I think uh, the fact that our the goal of Arlington Historical is to be an aggregation and point people to other sources but also just to make them more aware of, of the history itself. Like a lot of people would not have known about Ball's Crossroads Skirmish. So, uh, but again, it's not just Civil War history. There's a lot of history. Um, I think one of the stories that I thought was intriguing was, are you familiar about the code breaking going on in Arlington during World War II? And there's a book that came out called The Code Girls, is that the, the military and the security uh, forces, they hired uh, both uh, white and African-American women to break the codes. And uh, that was mostly for uh, uh, Japanese code books. Whereas, you know, you, you know about the Enigma project in England, the code girls were focusing on the communications that the Japanese Imperial Army were, were doing. Um, so those are fascinating stories and we still have tie-ins to that. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, there's a comment here that uh, this person lives in a historic site in Arlington. Um, they want to know if that's featured on your map or your app. Is there a way to search for a specific address or? Yeah, what's the uh, what's the house or what's the name of the property? Hi, it's Glenmore. Glenmore. Uh huh. That, that sounds familiar. Hang on a second. Uh, let's go ahead and. Um, let's go ahead and search for that. G L E N. Go ahead and spell that. G L E N, and it's spelled different ways. M O R E is one spelling. 
Let's try, try that one. There There's go. my house. Yeah. That's your okay. house. Oh, yeah. invite yeah. me. I'll, I'll take some updated pictures. Go ahead and check out the story. Um, I mean, again, I, I got the story from another source, but if That's you want, if you want to add, add to this, contact me and, uh, um, correct it or whatever. Yeah. Oh, if you, if there's something wrong, please let me know. Um, it was a lot of history I found. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. There, Thank you. Wait a second. There's some, there is some more modern day history here. If I remember correctly, the glass um, house. Mm-hmm. Well, not the big only that, parties. Though, the big parties, yeah. Uh -huh. I, I, have you ever done any metal detecting around um, that area? No, I've been digging up stuff while we were digging our yard up. That was like an archaeological dig here. But I invited the uh, White House military aides that I could find over for a party and told them their price of admission was one written story about the house. So I got some fabulous. What artifacts stuff. have you found associated with Bottles. That? Yeah. Models. And I think I have some Indian stuff, um, but I'm not sure. Uh, I'm on Donaldson was, Run. Yeah, yeah. What was the, uh, so it's it's there on the map. So if you look. Okay. You know, if you look on it, you'll see. That's me sitting on the front porch. What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Man, Just you've kidding. Aged, you've aged I'm, well. <laughs> haven't I? Yeah. When did you, you. when did you buy the house? But it was uninhabitable when we got it. Totally. It was horrific. Um, mm -hmm. And then we got it in 18, excuse me, 1983. Okay. And then yeah. got it in and renovated it. Yeah. Just the inside. Mm -hmm. well, well, good. I'm glad I had it. <laughs> That's great. All right. Thank you. So right, I'll go there and check it out. Yeah. And you can just send me something. There's an email info at, and it comes to me. So. Um, okay, yeah. Peter. A any other questions? So again, one of the one of the things remember now, um, the next phase is categorizing history. So if you notice, if you're interested in a particular type of history, um, uh, you know, obviously done a lot on Black history, business, civil rights. As you can see, Civil War is featured here prominently. Um, uh, I recently did a story on uh, Five Guys. A lot of people don't realize, but Five Guys got its start almost 40 years ago in Arlington. So um, um, it, a lot of interesting uh, things about restaurants and stuff like that, Marriott, all that stuff. But I think um, that's kind of interesting to kind of go through and look at the, um, in terms of science and technology. Uh, I thought this was interesting that, um, you know, Fort Meyer, uh, was involved with a lot of movies, you know, and um, definitely uh, that that kind of was interesting. Um, oh, do you guys all know the story about John Glenn, his house? And, you know, in the movie, The Right Stuff, when Lyndon yeah. Baines Johnson was waiting outside the house and John Glenn's wife didn't want to talk to him because she stuttered. Well, that's the house. But it's torn down now. But that that was the house where that scene in the movie uh, took place. So. And that was near uh, near Yorktown. So, um, you know, any Gary, anything else? Um, I'm not seeing any additional ones. Uh, I was going to ask: Are there <clears throat> particular topics that you haven't put in yet that you'd really like to add? Uh, well, again, here, as you can see, one of the one of the things that you know Arlington County basically wanted me to focus on is the you know again i mean we could have done a lot about the civil war the arlington house and all that stuff i mean cultural heritage there's there's different um groups here that you know uh, comparatively the, i'll give you a perfect example the hispanic history it's 40 years still emerging um the difference between black history and, and hispanic history it has to do with the fact that, you know, everyone thinks that everyone is in one bucket, but that's not the case. And there were different people from different countries and they all have their own unique history. My first apartment was Buckingham. And uh, I went and spoke to some of the people there that have, are, are trying to capture and teach the next generation to tell their stories. Um, you know, um, I in my digital storytelling class, um, 
I tell people the story that when I was growing up, my mom came from Athens and she was in Athens during the German occupation and her father was a tailor. And when the Germans came to the village, they they went to his shop and took his sewing machines. And, uh, uh, you know, that that was really hard on the family. And uh, uh, the story, the family story is, is that they happened to know someone who was German and they went to that person asking for them to help get one of the sewing machines back. And I guess the German said, OK, here, have one back. And in my mind growing up, that was a big story. And the first time I went to Greece, I wanted to see that sewing machine, but they had put it in this storage closet and it was all beat up and whatever. And I was, I thought that should have been in a museum, you know, that it was in my mind, it was an, an important story, but I think we all have those type of family, you know, stories. And um, I think uh, we, we want to track that. And I think the digital technologies, that's the lesson. If anything, you're all capable of telling and documenting those stories and being able to share with the next generation or whatever. And I think young people don't have a problem with social media telling information or whatever, but there are certain things that they've got to come up with just to make it interesting and compelling and, and whatever, just like the Glenmore. That's a fascinating story, that house or whatever. And uh, so glad that you're able to take care of that house. You know, that that's great. Okay, we've got a couple of other uh, comments. One of them is that Arlington was an important center for bluegrass music beginning in the 1940s. So I don't know if you've got stories in the entertainment uh, there actually, we could use more of those stories. So if anyone wants to lead me in that direction, uh, one of the things that I found, and, and if you're looking for something interesting, and that is in the 1930s, there was an all women swing band. They were living in Columbia Pike and they, uh, they were the first all women. They were integrated. Uh, they traveled in Europe during World War II and I uh, go to the story and uh, there's there's a music, I think. Let me see, do I have the, uh, I think I have, uh, let me just see if I can get the, uh, so that's the house. I don't think the house is there, but this is a photograph of the band. Uh, it's, again, it was a big band. So uh, um, hang on one second. Um, I think I have the music, I'm pretty sure. But while I'm searching for this, any there's another photograph. I mean, you, you just can't. Yeah, they were called the International Sweethearts of Rhythm. And I think somewhere I've got an audio file. I hope I do anyway. And this is a this is a story that I got from um uh, the uh, you know Center for Local History. So, uh, but yeah, uh, uh, Jimmy Dean. He um, oh, you know the the gentleman or whoever the person said about the country music. One of the the term country country music originated on an F, um, an FM radio station in Arlington that was located near the Arlington Hospital. So that um, that's kind of interesting. So. Um, what else do we got, Gary? I know we're winding well, up. Your, your comment about uh, Five Guys sparked a number of conversations. Uh, the original one was in the Westmont Shopping Center. Yes. Redeveloped. And there, there was a bakery called Brenner's that supplied yes. the for the burger. Right, right. No, uh, do, and do you know that the company is like now a billion dollar company? That's okay. that's what. Yeah. Like there's there's like 1500 stores all around the world you know there's a there's a five guys in dubai or whatever but um yeah anything else gary no um uh, other than uh pointing out that you posted a link to uh, an aging matters that might be relevant to people so uh, right that um, Peter, I I also produce a radio show and a TV show called Aging Matters, mm -hmm. and um, several years ago I did I do something called Stories of Life, and I featured Brenda Cox, who was in one of the first classes in Arlington, to that was um, 
um, that was part of it was in desegregation. Mm. And she was in a small high school and moved to a huge, huge different high school. I don't have all the details, but that was an episode. And then I also produced something that um, Steve mentioned in terms of Craig Syfex. And I saw uh -huh. on your, on your uh, uh, photos here about uh, Evelyn Syfex. I suspect that was his mother. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, he was very much involved um, on the Black History Museum. So the people oh, want to... Oh, yeah. And by the way, um, I was really thrilled to meet Dr. Taylor. Uh, he's 94 years old. And one of the things that we talked about was baseball. And I'm hoping to follow up with him and capture that. Um, I mean, I, I, first off, I just love baseball and just talking about baseball was exciting, but it was an interesting history of in the forties, fifties, you know, the Negro leagues, the, the, the teams, there was the white Sox and the black Sox. And um, from what I understand, Dale, Dale Smith is a member of, uh, the Arlington Historical Society board. His father played uh, in those leagues. And I would just love to work with the Black History Museum and um, the Historical Society, Center for Local History, to, to be able to do kind of like Ken Burns, you know, his thing on baseball. Uh, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, Ken Burns is considered the father of digital history because, mm -hmm. you know, the whole Civil War series just... And in fact, if you use iMovie, there's an effect on iMovie called the Ken Burns effect, you know, that taking the images and sliding them and that type of thing. Um, but no, I think doing, I know there's probably been lots of stuff already done on Dr. Taylor, but I, I just think the young people need to really hear that story. I mean, it's just a fascinating story of perseverance and, um, you know, and, and sports just happens to be a commonality that everyone can share and be proud of it's a great history so do you um, have any contact with craig syfex i i believe i i met him at the museum right okay, I, okay. is that it, it, it i i believe i met you right i think i did well i'd be happy to um you know send you his contact information because craig is is very much involved yet with the museum and oh um, yeah oh oh yeah i i think that you're you're exemplifying the importance for people to um, collaborate because it's these projects as he could tell you and and I could tell you with dealing with the historical society, you're doing this as a volunteer, you know, and it's hard to really do it all by yourself. Right. And I'm sorry, but the wisdom of the crowd is the way to go. You never, you know, I mean, you can tell me what I got right or wrong about the house, the Glenmore, but you know, you could, you do your best to try to, you know, make sure that you're, presenting good quantified information, qualified information, but you never know. So it's always good, but that's the right. good, thing. but that's the good thing about digital history is that if you get something wrong, you can correct it rather quickly versus yep. if you publish a book, well, okay, God forbid, you got to go back and republish or whatever. So not making fun of doing books. I'm just thinking that there is, it's, it's kind of a, a bonus with, with digital history. So. Absolutely. Well, it's five after 11. And so we always try to end as close to um, 11 as possible. So I want to thank Peter Vassilopoulos and for his very interesting uh, account of Arlington history and learning about digital uh, technology. And, um, and hopefully we all now have that app on our phones so we can look everything up. So I Very hope welcome. I, I got to show Arlington the numbers are growing up. Help me out. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Peter. And for next week, um, you'll this is more of a health kind of uh, uh, presentation. You're going to hear uh, John Darns, who is a physical therapist and uh, a health coach. And he is going to talk about being a person. He is a personal trainer and what people need to know about that. So be sure and tune in next week, April 17th at 10 o'clock Wednesday. Uh, and the title, as I said, is Using a Personal Trainer. So hope you all have a good week and we'll see you uh, next week at the same time. Cheryl, thank you for having me and thank you all A&D. And hey, can I put a plug in for Bocce? All I can say is that A&V supporting Bocce is the best thing ever.
<laughs> well, I know there's a lot of people who do it. And so there's a lot of very active members in A and B. So you may want to think about joining. Heck yeah. <laughs> All right. You take care, everybody.